Welcome to The Old Man and the Three Things with Nikias Duncan and Steve Jones. Fellas, how we doing on this Monday? I know, Nikias, uh, you, like me, a little down after that 49, 49ers-Eagles game last night. A tough one. Just a tough one for the birds. Yeah, just trying to flush that one. Tried to gain a little perspective after that beatdown. Like, you know, that's only the second loss this year. Still got the division lead. Should be okay. Uh, we flushed this one. Props to the Niners. We go again on Sunday. Good thing uh, I did have a, a win yesterday. Uh, first city league game for uh, Brooklyn Basketball Academy, fourth grade squad. Uh, we got a win. Big time comeback, 133 to 30. Uh, just want to give a shout out to the coach who I uh, coached against twice now um, from Chelsea Piers Revolution, Evolution, whatever they're called. Chelsea Piers, great coach. This guy has these kids running great stuff. They do play a one two two zone, which I'm going to save my rants for zones at nine years old for another day because we have a lot to get into. Oh. I did tweet. I tweeted out. Somebody said we need to stop playing zone in youth basketball, and I tweeted out. Shout it from the rooftops and. People are talking about, hey, these kids know what they need to know. Yeah, they need to learn how to play zone and play against zone when they're like 15. But a nine-year-old uh, who can't shoot past 15 feet, can't pass the ball more than eight feet in the air, it's like, what are we doing? What are we doing? It's a mini rant. Anyways, guys, we're going to cover a lot today. Uh, let's get right into it. I want to talk about the Milwaukee Bucks. The good, the bad. All right. They are 14 and six tied for the second best record in the league with the magic. We have discussed maybe a month ago, uh, them switching some of the defensive coverages. They are an elite offense right now. Number four offensively, um, still, you know, in aggregate, the numbers defensively, not great. Uh, number 21 overall defensive, uh, rating. The one thing, uh, before I let you guys kind of get into it, they are nine and three in clutch games. They should be 10 and two. Uh, they lost to Chicago the other night when Caruso tied it up to send it to overtime. Befuddling decision not to foul up three. Um, and Adrian Griffin said after the game, my bad. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully they don't make that mistake again. But Dame in the clutch this season. He's played in 11 of those 12 clutch games. They're 9-2. and two. He's got 67 points in 49 minutes on 50-41 uh, shooting splits. 28 of 29 from the free throw line. 10 assists, 3 turnovers. This, to me, uh, let, we, we're going to talk about the defense, of course, but this, to me, is like the reason you go get Dame. Uh, because of the ability to close games late, uh, something that, at times, they, they struggled with, creating good offense. And Dame has just been dominant so far this season in clutch time. Yeah, I think in clutch time, that's where you kind of see, like, as you said, like, this is why we brought him here. But you also see the hierarchy more clear than it ever is. Once you get late to these games, I think early on there was just the natural adjustment period with Dame and Giannis, who's doing what, how are they being used together. Late in games, it's just like Dame go cook. We'll set some high screens for you, whether it's him and Brooke, or if it's Giannis screening for him, he can get to the pull-ups. He has been one of the best drivers in the NBA, even with the poor shooting start to the season. He's been able to get downhill pretty much whenever he wants to. And once he turns the clutch time, like there really isn't a good defense for him. And I think zooming out to him and Giannis being used together that's kind of been the most encouraging sign for me as of late. It feels like that pick and roll pairing is finally starting to get off the ground a little bit. Uh, Steve and I talked about the Dame Giannis partnership a couple of weeks ago on the pod. And I asked Steve, like, what are you seeing from those two? Because their pick and roll numbers together just were not good, to be frank about it. I was like, is this just missed shots? Our defense is doing anything? Is this just an adjustment period? And Steve noted, like, this is just an adjustment period between these two. They're trying to learn the cadence of each other, trying to figure out where, you know, where their spots are, how they like the ball, et cetera. And I think between the level of spacing that they're putting around those two, where they're where they're setting those ball screens, how they're spacing around it, how they're clearing the wings a little bit more often. And I think Dame has finally gotten used to, okay, Giannis is just not going to roll super hard early. Like, he's going to be more of a short roll guy so he can survey things. And I think those pocket passes got a little bit cleaner. And now it just seems like there really isn't a good scheme for them. It's like what we kind of expect the heading into the year is starting to come to fruition. There isn't a great scheme. Like watching the end of the Atlanta game, Atlanta's put two to the ball more than just about anyone in the league this year. Milwaukee just dices them up. In that Chicago game, it's a bunch of switches. And as Steve and I were watching that game live, I was like, hey, you should probably feed Giannis while he has Io DeSumo on him, but neither here nor there. But even in that contest, you could see Dame could just drive against anyone. And you do have the inherent mismatch with Giannis. Playing drop against Dame doesn't seem to be great. Um, so just very quickly before I pass this off to Steve, I know I've been talking quite a bit so far. <laughs> um, 
So since November 3rd, which was Adrian Griffin basically saying, okay, we're going to play drop again. Let's, let's, let's simplify things. Let's get that right. So since November 3rd, uh, one, they're 12th in defense since then. But with Damon Giannis, 1.08 points per possession in pick and roll between those two, that's 10th among 49 high-volume pairings. So those numbers definitely ticking up. And over the last couple of weeks since November 21st, 1.3 points per possession on any trip featuring a Damian Giannis pick and roll. They are starting good. to set the world on fire. That seems good. <laughs> very, very good. It, it seems very good. And I think just to bounce off what y'all said, if you look at it in a vacuum, last year, what, 15th in offensive rating, 4th in defensive rating. This year, 4th in offensive rating, 21st in defensive rating. So we've seen the trade-off after all this time. I think the biggest thing for me to add to Nikaias' clutch point, it's they're using everyone together. So it's not just Dame and Giannis. Hey, Chris Middleton, Giannis, y'all both go screen for Dame. And because of Dame's drives, you don't know if he's going to come off. You don't know if it's going to be a reject. I think offensively, they found their rhythm together. I think this feels like a team that understands what they can be and is continuing to work towards it. I think the early offense feels a lot better. They're looking to get the ball up. They're looking to attack quick. They're starting to feel more decisive with their flow. So if we get one hand off, we don't have it, we go to the other side. You put two on the ball, hit the pocket pass, do a big, big pass or skip it. They're making those type of plays, which I think helps their base. I think that's the most important thing. If they can combine having not just Damon Giannis, but hey, let's get Middleton going. Let's keep Beasley hitting threes. Brooke Lopez perking up offensively. Bobby Portis can come in and give you 10, 12 and a quarter off the bench. And now if we have those going on top of what we can do with Damon Giannis, I think that's where that blend is going to come in for Milwaukee. So they're not just spamming or relying on, we can just put pressure on you with Damon Giannis. Let's try and figure out the rest of the boat and then add that to it. Yeah. A, f- a few things. And Nikias, I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you came prepared today. I love the, the stat from November 3rd. They are 12th in defense. So clearly trending in the right direction once they made that switch and went back to drop coverage. Um, the other thing is the, the, the spamming action doesn't just, uh, what, what Steve just said is important because it, it isn't just the Giannis Dame pick and roll. They have at times span that, spam that 45 action, which is just two guys, whoever it may be, and, and they, they mix up who it is, but two guys come and set a super high ball screen on Dame and they've had some success with that. And I think some of the numbers in terms of the Giannis Dame pick and roll pairing going up are because Dame now is shooting the three better. Over his last 10, he's a shade under 39% from three on eight and a half attempts a game. So those early three-point struggles, he's now shooting basically a little bit above his career average from three, and that certainly helps. On the Middleton thing, like he's still, you know, the, the minutes aren't are massive. He started the season out on a minutes restriction. He's only averaging about 21 minutes a game, and he's still working his way back. It's, it feels like since that injury uh, against the Celtics uh, two seasons ago, it hasn't been like a a a full blown Chris Middleton uh, period of time where you know he's getting thirty to thirty five minutes, and maybe he never gets back to that. But I will say his minutes are so important. He's he's got the highest net rating of any of their regular rotation guys, almost ten points better uh, per one hundred possessions uh, when he's on the court. And I think to some degree, the offense just works better when he's out there um, because of his passing, his size, of course, his shooting. And, and so I think, you know, we're going to talk a ton this season about Damon Giannis. They're going to get a ton of spotlight once we get to the playoffs. But I think Middleton still, to me, is is really such a key piece for these guys. And if if he can potentially be... I don't even want to say above average, just like average on the ball against bigger wings in the playoffs um, because of their, you know, their, their, their lack of like that stopper. I, I think he's sort of the key for me right now when I look at the Bucs and in, in, in terms of the big picture. Anyone else for you that has stood out? I know Steve kind of mentioned a few guys, but Nikai, anyone else for you and the Bucs that has stood out uh, good or bad over the last uh, two, three weeks? Um, you hit on the Middleton point, so I won't hang there too long. I think on the bad slash questionable side, like very niche. Is it time to have a conversation about Pat Connaughton? Because mm. I think they needed him to be an important role piece for them on both ends of the floor, even before you get into like what you may need from Marjan Bochamp, what we may see from Andre Jackson. Jay Crowder's obviously been out. 
even before that kind of wing cycling, you kind of needed Pat Conta to knock down shots and hold his own defensively. And the defense, I feel, has been okay, but you want to be better than that. We're two straight years where he's shooting basically 34% on catch and shoot threes. And if that portion dips for him, like I think it really does hinder the wing room for Milwaukee, I would imagine they're going to be hunting around trying to find something before February anyway. But if Pat isn't going to knock down shots and you just have the size concerns against a team like Boston or Miami with what they can bring in the wing room, I think it's just worth keeping an eye on him. I think beyond that, like Brooke Lopez has been incredible. Like I cited the 12th in defense since November 3rd. He's averaging 3.3 blocks per game since then. Yeah. Yeah, which awesome. <laughs> obviously defense isn't just about blocks, but yeah, right, has right, been right, right. In, he's been insane. All right, well, let's get to our second thing here. Um, Western Conference still believe it's loaded with a bunch of really good teams. And, and you know, coming into the year, I, I think there was some buzz about some of the smaller market teams, but we're always going to have to talk about the Lakers and the Clippers and the Warriors and Denver and, Phoenix, of course, Luka and Dallas, Sacramento. But there's three teams that I want to ask you guys about, and that's the Minnesota Timberwolves, the New Orleans Pelicans, and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Wolves are currently in first, Oklahoma City in second. Pelicans, again, with some health issues, but they sit in eighth right now. Of these three teams, who are you most high on as a real Western Conference contender uh, amongst the Wolves, Pelicans, and Thunder? Guys, you got a t- you got a tough decision, buddy. I sure do. I sure do. It's like this Minnesota season has been very fun, and Oklahoma City. I, I, if you've heard me on the pod, any of these pods, you know how I feel about the Thunder. Like I probably slightly lean OKC. One, they're one of two teams right now per clean the glass. They're top ten in offense and defense right now. Shea's been playing at an MVP level. Chad Holmgren's been incredible. I just love. I just love the concept of OKC. Depending on who they put in the lineup, all five guys can grab a defensive rebound and push and set something up. Anyone can make dry pass shoot decisions. Anyone can be used as a screener. Anyone can use a ball screen. Like, it's hard to really key in on them as a concept before getting into just how good Shea is. And so I think with that kind of versatility offensively and the way that they're shooting the ball, which I would imagine they're going to dip a little bit. I don't think they're the best three-point shoot team to lead. But you get good shooting from them and all the drivers and the way that they can swarm around defensively and you add Chet into the mix as well. Like, they're probably the team I feel best about. Like, there's something with Minnesota's offense that's still holding me back from going all the way in, but they've been really freaking good. Okay. I got a question here real quick for y'all. Okay. With OKC, I think one of the biggest things is they feel unflappable to a degree. Mm. They feel like their offense, we're going to impose our will. We're going to drive. We're going to drive. We're going to drive. As soon as you think you've caught up on that rhythm, we're going to add cutting. We're going to continue to move. All of our personnel fits, as Nakia stated. My question for y'all is, what is their flaw? What is their thing? Is it shooting? Is it defense? What's the one thing that's holding you back? The one thing that's holding me back with OKC, I especially among these three teams, I do not trust them to end possessions in the way that the other two can. I trust them to get stops and force misses more than New Orleans, even though I love her. Minnesota has just been the best defense in the league all year long, so I'm not going to put them there, but I think they are an elite defense. The defensive rebounding puts it throws me for a loop. Because Chet isn't the biggest guy, and if he's out on the perimeter defending something, then you're trusting Jalen or Josh or Shea. And like, they're all good positionally rebounding, but there's just a size deficit they're at. They just bleed rebounds on both ends. And I think within a playoff context, that's something that, that keeps me from saying, oh, they're just going to make the Western Conference Finals because of how good they are. Like, I don't know if they can end possessions at a high level right now. Yeah, unflappable. I like that word, Steve. Uh, if you, anybody who watched the Dallas game the other night, uh, they're up 111.87. Dallas goes on a 30-0 run. I was watching the game live. and everything going right for Dallas. And you 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 kind of watch when teams are making those runs, you're watching the body language, you're watching the bench, you're watching uh Mark Dagnall, you're watching the players. And like they never broke. They never broke character. And they they st- they get down 6 and they still find a way to win that game. I think overall like for me, there's a confidence and in some ways like a very 
um, a very positive, irrational confidence about the group. Like all the guys individually have confidence, but there's a confidence about the group uh, that I love. Uh, you talk about imposing your will, number one in the league in drives, number four in points off drives, uh, per NBA.com, number five offense, number five defense. Like their pro f- number one in three point percentage, their profile uh, looks really good. As Nikaya said, they're 29th in de- defensive rebounding. So clearly, I think the size for me, again, that they have bigger players. But you talk about size, I, I think of Jokic and I think of Aaron Gordon and I think of Anthony Davis. Like there, there's, there's like width, depth, size. You know what I mean? I don't want to use the word girth because Ryan Rucco will say something crazy to me. Uh, but I did just use it. Uh, Nikaias, you said, you said something earlier and I, I was going to touch on this when we talked about these three teams, uh, which you use the word hierarchy in reference to, uh, Dame and Giannis and clutch time. And what I, what I like about OKC is that there is a clear hierarchy to their team. Shea is the guy, right? And then they have talented players around him, but it's very clear that Shea is the guy. I think one of the real impressive things this year with Minnesota is that Cat has sort of accepted I'm the second guy, right? Ant's the guy. I'm I'm the Robin here. And he's been efficient. He's played well. I'm going to ask you some stuff about him specifically. And then with the Pelicans, I still think there's some questions about the hierarchy. And, and some of that is not just because you have B.I. and Zion, young players trying to establish who's the guy. I think some of it is just time spent together. Just so many injuries. CJ as well. I, I said this last year when they started the season and they were healthy. It's like, who who's the third guy there? Because CJ is going to shoot. CJ is going to be aggressive. He's going to be he's going to be who he's been his whole career. And so I think they've they've got to figure out that for an extended period of time. Andrew Lopez, right before we jumped on the pod, uh, released an article talking about their players only meeting a while back. Since that players only meeting. 152 minutes that B.I. and Zion have been on the court together, and they have a net rating of 21, 127.6 offensive rating, 106.1 defensive rating. Both, of course, would be league best offense, league best defense. I I think ultimately, when we talk about the Pelicans, um, it's health, but it's also, can B.I. be at his best and can Zion be at his best together? Uh, Because everything else about this team, look... (laughs) Herb Jones is a monster. He's one of the, like one of my favorite players to watch. And I don't even like defense. I didn't play defense. I love what <laughs> he's a wrecking ball. He he's like, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to one, one possession. He's taking a charge. The next possession, he's going vertical and blocking a shot. The next possession, he's getting in the passing lane. Then he's locking someone up and deflecting the ball out of bounds. Then, then he's blocking a three point shot. Then he's getting out of transition and dunk. like, he is just a menace on top of that. Dyson Daniels has been a menace defensively. They have shooting. Uh, you would expect uh, specifically B.I. and C.J.'s three-point shooting to, to sort of go back up. Both those guys are down. But Jordan Hawkins, Matt Ryan, who's been really good for them, he's hurt. And, and then Trey Murphy back in the lineup. They have size with Valanchunas. They have, you know, on at least on paper, if, if Larry Nance could ever figure this ankle out, you know, they have some switchability in a playoff series. Like there's a lot of question marks about the Pelicans, but I haven't sold all my stock on them. I have not sold all my stock on them. I still believe they can be a really, really good team. Keep your stock. Keep your stock. I'm going to introduce a third hypothetical in the hierarchy, and that's ball movement. The ball movement. I want people to watch the ball movement from the New Orleans Pelicans and the flow that they have. Now, one thing I'll add, Zion Williamson, fifth in the league in drives per game. Brandon Ingram, 15th in the league in drives per game. Keep an eye on the drives from Brandon Ingram. We think about the mid-range, but watch the plays that he's starting to make. Watch the passing from Zion Williamson. Watch how the Pelicans move the ball from side to side. It's not just go get a bucket. They can play through Jonas Valanciunas. We can use Zion in different ways. Get him off dribble handoffs. Use him in pick and roll. Having CJ back makes an impact because now they're able to flow from action to action. I think that's the one thing that gets lost sometimes in the league is like, Yes, your talent is great. Yes, they can go get buckets. But there's also an element of, hey, there's a wave here where we have to defend this, and now we have to defend that. And I think the Pelicans are starting to tap into that button, which I think is key for them, because it's not just, okay, 
anyone can initiate the set. Anyone can move. They have more cutting, they have more movement. There's more stuff after the first play. And now you mix in Zion at the five. And now he can come off and pick and roll. They can use screens for him. You're seeing cutting from Herb. You're seeing aggression from Herb. You're seeing them just make those kind of decisive plays where, oh no, CJ McCollum is now one pass away. I should help on that Zion post up. Oh no, I've helped. Now CJ has either made a shot or drove. Oh no, we're in rotation. That's the kind of stuff where I'm like, hey, keep an eye on that part for the Pelicans. Because if they can nail those with the margins, a lot of their guys have had to play, I don't want to say above their weight, but they've had to carry a little bit more because of the injuries. I don't want to say the H word, but if they can keep everything in line, I think they've got a lot of depth. I think the defense is active. I have no numbers to support it. But if you watch them, I know, I know. Well, full no, the active <laughs> is a good word. Dyson Daniels. I know I, a week ago he was leading the league in deflections. Herb Jones, like he, he's, he was up there all of last season. Like they're, they're super active just with those two guys. Uh, and on paper, at least, Tra- you know, Trey Murphy as a bigger wing defender. Let me ask you a question, actually. Because I was in my notes this morning out when I was writing uh, out the hierarchy stuff and some notes on the Pelicans. Is there a is there a scenario when we talk about hierarchy here? Is there a scenario because I'm super high on Trey Murphy, where the hierarchy becomes Bi Zion Trey Murphy, and not CJ or Valanciunas? I mean, if if Trey is number three, that's a massive win for the Pelicans, in my opinion. I- I think there, I think there could be a world where that happens. He's got the mindset. He's got the scoring ability. So yeah, I'm with it. But you, you also didn't answer the initial question. I just want to point that out. Nikaias, thank you for going out of limb and saying OKC. Okay, Steve, instead of answering the question, he decided to ask a question. But now I'm going to force his hand and make him answer the question <laughs> of these three teams. <laughs> Who are you most high on? Minnesota. Okay, it's Minnesota. Right. Ah. It's Minnesota okay. for me. Uh, because of the fact that they are answering some of the questions you may have had about them coming in. Now, Nikaias had his questions about the offense. I feel better about the offense this year than last year. There seems to be more of a purpose, more of a flow, since this is the word of the day, hierarchy. Anthony Edwards, it's great that he's scoring. The playmaking stands out to me. And the fact that you can trust him to make some of these plays, he's making quicker decisions. Come off pick and roll. I don't have to explore this for five to eight seconds. If I don't have it, I get right off of it. Mike Conley is a perfect fit for that team in the sense that I can initiate the offense. I can get the ball where it needs to go. I can play off the ball. So I can make shots and I can attack closeouts that way. Cat feels more comfortable with the actions they're trying to run for him. They've got a lot of stuff out of horns, whether it's just pick and pop, pick and roll, set a pin down for Anthony Edwards on the weak side. I just like the fact that they, no matter who's in the lineup, there's an element of versatility. There's an element of size, and there's an element of playmaking that allows that to work. Now, the key for me is the defense, and the key for the defense has been Rudy Gobert getting back to form, as some would say. And he's been really good as far as defending in space, as far as containing in that drop. So where it's not just, I'm back here, come at me. No, I can play in between. I can contain that drive. I can stun at you and recover. I can protect the rim without giving everything up. His multiple efforts have made things go well. I think Cat has fought. We've seen more aggression from him on the drive. I like what Minnesota has built. I think they're answering a lot of the questions. So for me, I would probably trust Minnesota more because, hey, we can get Ant going in the fourth. We have this defensive product where if it's peaking and working, it's very tough. You may not look to take these paint shots that you normally take if Rudy's uh, peaking at a high level. I trust Minnesota. Okay. I like it. Boom. I'm, gonna say, I'm, I'm I, by the way, I, I love all three of these teams and this is not like, I, I'm going to get killed by whoever that I don't choose, but uh, you know, I'm going to say Minnesota right now. Um, they have been the best team in the Western conference. Um, they've won against a lot of really good teams. I, I think the, there, there's three things for me and there's obviously you, you brought up Conley, uh, you know, Jaden McDaniels love him. Uh, Nas Reed, love him. The, the the three things for me, even going back to last year after the trade, I remember Tommy and I did an episode on the old man and the three things, talking about Minnesota, their ceiling. I think we did our Western Conference predictions or whatever. And like the three things, when I look at this team that is happening right now, Gobert, 
returning to form, looking super mobile, making like high, high level defensive plays. Two is Cat embracing this role and playing efficiently. He's done that. And then three is like further growth from Anthony Edwards, which we've seen. And sometimes, you know, we see this like massive leap. But for me, it's like, even going back to last season, it's been this like incremental growth from Anthony Edwards in terms of his decision making, his engagement defensively, you know, em- embracing, really kind of embracing like modern shot profiles. Um, you know, right now he is having a career high in field goal percentage, three point percentage, free throw percentage, rebounds, assists, points. He's got a 12.0 net rating. Like he's playing at an all NBA level. So you have him playing at all NBA level, Cat playing great, Gobert being Gobert, the defensive player of the year that we saw. Like that's an elite team. That's an elite team. And I don't really have a ton of question marks for OKC outside of the size and the rebounding thing. Pelicans, I think there's a little more question marks. So I think it's hard for me to say this. But it's also like the most logical thing. I think the Minnesota Timberwolves are going to be in the mix for the number one, number two, number three seed, whatever, all year long in the Western Conference, assuming health. And they're a real team. They're a real team. And we saw them battle the Nuggets in that first round shorthanded. You go back and all those Nuggets guys are like, yeah, that was that was our toughest series. That was the, that was the team that gave us the most problems, even though it was 4-1. That was the team. So I, I'm high on the I'm high on the Timberwolves, really high on the Timberwolves. Just very quickly on the Minnesota Minnesota front, because I did just throw out there like I have some questions about the offense. Like for me, the stuff that Steve and I've talked about quite a bit is like cat versus switches. I feel like the drives have been better. It's kind of gone from do you have the talent to beat switches and more what is the decision making like after you get the switch? Will you force something up versus can you draw something good and create something else for someone else? Uh, just a quick number. I just pulled up on second spectrum. Do you know who's number 30 in points per possession against switches? Uh, I'm going to guess it, because we're talking about them, the Minnesota Timberwolves. They are the Minnesota Timberwolves. <laughs> <laughs> like that, <laughs> that portion of concern. That's a cause for concern. I agree. <laughs> it's a cause for concern. And like, it's weird because like, I don't feel bad about, again, like you put a small guy on cat. I feel better that he's going to do something about that. With Rudy, like there will always be questions, but I at least trust he's going to create an extra possession if he does miss a shot at the rim. Anthony Edwards can create a shot against anyone. But like in the back of my mind, it's like he also knows that he created a shot against anyone. And I just kind of worry in a playoff context, if teams do decide we're just going to switch this and flatten it out. And it turns into, Ant, will you drive, draw something, and then we play out of that? Or will you just step back against someone because you can do that? That's where my brain goes to. I don't know yet. <laughs> hey, this is, this is long-term storytelling. Because this is what I said last time we talked about Minnesota, and now we have switched <laughs> roles. That is fantastic. Uh, I do think it is a concern. Uh, I think it's more of a playoff context concern than anything else. Yes. I think it's, again, they have to answer that for Cat. Can we take some of these switches off the board? And they have to make sure they can protect Rudy. I think if they can do those two things, a lot of the, the concerns go away. But that could be their fatal flaw. Like, is there is there something, JJ, that you think – okay, there's just one piece that's missing. Is it the bench? Is it the lineup versatility? Is there, is there something that might be off with them? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think it goes back to exactly what Nikai has just brought up in that if you have a number one defense and you have enough talent offensively, you're going to win games in the regular season. I, I think my concerns come down to the playoffs, which, again, it, it comes back to, to spacing. Uh, it comes back to, you know, Cat's ability to score or make the right decision against switches. Uh, and it comes down to in, in that environment where you're, you're going to face a team that's just going to switch everything. Are you creating enough ball movement? Are you creating enough like good shots that aren't just Anthony Edwards contested or Cat, you know, trying to, trying to bully someone? Uh, that, that's really what it is. I, I think it's going to be hard for this team to ever have like a top five offense. Like it's just not the way they're built. Right. Um, you're taking cat away from his best position offensively, best position offensively is as a five, but then there's the trade off defensively. 
So if you're, I think we brought up the word identity on this show. If your identity is going to be, we are going to be the best defensive team in the league night to night. We are going to be hard to score against. We're going to provide, we're going to, uh, create a lot of situations where you're shooting contested shots, where we're, we're going to grab every rebound. Like you have an identity, you have a chance to win a game when you have an identity in the NBA and night to night, they have an identity right now. So I think in, in the regular season, just not super concerned offensively. I think they, they've got enough night to night that they're going to get, they're going to be in games. Uh, it, it really comes down to those playoff matchups. And again, like we don't know who they're playing in the first round yet. We'll get to that in April. Uh, speaking of the first round, first in-season tournament. Let's wrap this show up. We've got two games tonight, two quarterfinals games tonight, and two quarterfinal ga- games tomorrow night. Semifinals are Thursday in Vegas. Uh, I'm probably going to be at those games. Uh, not working, though, just as a fan. I will be on first take on Friday. All you people that think <laughs> I got kicked off first take. He's back. Fuck out yeah. Of here. Uh, and Saturday uh, is the uh, is the finals, guys. I love these matchups. Just a little geeking out fandom. We got Boston Indy, uh, we got New Orleans Sac, we got Knicks Milwaukee, and Phoenix LA. What game uh, in this quarterfinal matchups are you most excited about? Uh, I think for me, it is going to be Pelicans Kings for me. And because of what we talked about in the Pelicans section with Herb Jones, Dyson Daniels in particular, I am very excited to see those two against all of the perimeter fun that Sacramento brings to the table. I am here for Herb Jones potentially just getting the De'Aaron Fox matchup off rip and seeing what happens there. De'Aaron Fox has been on a tear since he's been back. Herb Jones, for my eyes, however much stock you want to put into them, like he's just been firmly a top 10 defender, and that's probably conservative from what I'm seeing from him this year. I want to see those two go at it. JV versus Sabonis is going to be a very strong man matchup up front. But like as Steve pointed to, the JV usage has been fun. We know what Sabonis can do with handoffs. I think that's just going to be, that's going to feel like a playoff atmosphere for me. I think we're going to see a lot of in-game adjustments between those two. That's probably the game that I have uh, circled for me. Ah, I'm not surprised you took Kings Pelicans. I'm going to go left. Give me Knicks Bucks. Oh, give me <laughs> Knicks Bucks. Let me see Jalen Brunson. What did he drop? 45 last time these two played in the yeah, NCAA tournament? I did the game. I did the game. Yeah. Let me see them go at it. Let me see Julius Randle try and get all these buckets. Let me see if Dante DiVincenzo can pull some revenge out of himself. Let's there watch this. Go. Let's watch this Milwaukee offense operate as New York tries to take things away. Mitchell Robinson, what decisions are you going to make? Go ahead and give me that. Serve that up to me. I like it. I like it. I don't like watching the Knicks play. <laughs> Don't. I love all the guys on the team. It's not that. It's just, I don't know. It's whatever. Um, for me, it's New Orleans, Sacramento, for sure. And uh, I, I think a number of reasons that um, uh, Nikai has touched on. I, I think one of the reasons I'm excited about this game is because I truly believe that it will have a playoff-like atmosphere in Sacramento. And the other reason is I would lo- actually love not that I have any invested interest in any of this, but I would love to see a team like New Orleans or lo- love to see a team like Sacramento win the first in-season tournament and and sort of solidify the meaning of what this is because I think their fan bases probably would care more than, let's say, the Boston Celtics. I think that's fair to say. Is that is that out of line? But I think that's fair to say. No, you, you can see the... If, Bo- if Boston ends up losing this game, like I would plan for something bigger. It just kind of yeah, has yeah. that air to it. Like, yeah, I-, I get where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, guys, you're awesome as always. Uh, always fun doing this on Mondays. Uh, again, in-season tournament uh, matchups. Two games tonight on TNT. Two games on Tuesday night on TNT. Semifinals on Thursday in Vegas. Finals on Saturday in Vegas. 